Captain's log, supplemental. We stopped by Ryza to let the crew get some R&R. On my day ashore, I decided to try out a new feature they've recently added, triple yoga. Those fuzzy little things really do reduce stress. I'd love to bring a few aboard as a supplement to the holodeck suites, but apparently the little fuzzballs reproduce like crazy. I was told to go read Kirk's logs from the original 1701. Apparently it's good for a laugh. everybody welcome to another episode of captain's log supplemental my name is stanford i am joined by my uh couple of couple of friends and co-hosts chris hey there and you're right chris that was very deep yeah it's uh so for for forwarding everybody here i apologize i'll probably sound a little bit nasally just getting over some something so bear with me and rob I am not sick this week. <laughs> and we are joined by our marvelous producer, Mariah. Hi there. Captain's Log Supplemental is a Star Trek rewatch podcast. We rewatch Star Trek in chronological order. We're still making our way through Enterprise. It's awful. We hate it. Um, although we're having fun with the podcast. I mean, it's not all awful. Mm, this yeah, episode this was... Good here. Mm, this was uh, not a good episode. Yeah. If uh, you like what you hear, or if you don't, go ahead and uh, throw us a five star review because we are five star people, and uh, you know, give us a, give us a uh, like a worded review, and I'll read it out. Uh, send us some hate mail, you know, whatever, whatever you want to do, that'd be fun. So um, this this story, I was reading the story earlier, and it it brought my mind back to Star Trek. Um, do you guys hear about this uh, the Stingray that got pregnant, and nobody knows how? The one that's supposed no. to be giving birth to Stephen Irwin or something? <laughs> right. So <laughs> so there's this what? Stingray uh, who's been in this this aquarium tank for years now at this point. Female Stingray. Uh, no other males in the tank. And they're pregnant. And so there's basically three theories as to how this happened. Oh, is it is it like, is it like, quote unquote, immaculate conception, like a possible thing with like animals? Right. So, so one, okay, so... This is all hilarious and awesome and reminds me of Star Trek. So one, uh, cross-species breeding. So one theory is that uh, a male bamboo shark mated with the stingray and it just somehow worked. You know, oh, they did okay. the horizontal interspecies oh. polka. Well, uh, I mean, they're both sharks, so, you know, they're at least semi-related. It's, it's and like, love you know, love. close enough. <laughs> very, very much Star Trek style, yeah, right? You no know, one is kink-shaming them. It's just impressive that they were able to pull it off. Right. <laughs> well, exactly. Wait, wait. Is is a stingray really a, a type of shark? Yes. They're in the same oh. family, yes. They oh, are they are not know. cartilaginous predatory fish. So yeah, I say I don't know if it's an exact uh parallel, but you know, kind of humans to gorillas type situation. I would think it more like uh like a like a liger, you know? Like uh, the lion tiger concept. Like they're pretty close. So like like Homo sapien to Neanderthal, that kind of thing. Or like um or like uh, dingo dogs. Like dingoes are like like pretty different, but they still manage to pull off a dingo dog every once in a while. Yeah. Uh, so so that's the first theory. Theory two is is kind of immaculate conception. It's somehow asexually reproducing. You know, as as one video I saw put it, uh, creating little baby stesis. Um There is a word for that <sighs> because it does actually happen. Um, I forget what it's called. It, 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 there was a whole house episode where he like said it once as a joke. Um, but it like does happen in, in very rare cases and animals like zygote will just fucking just, just, just turn on and it'll just, it'll just start going with like, like with just maternal DNA and like this kind of semi clone thing. And create little baby stasis. Yep. yep. Um, and, uh, so, um, there's that one, which reminded me of that one Counselor Troy episode where she was, you know, just pregnant all of a sudden. Uh, in, no, where, in that that generation. where that non-corporeal entity just went straight up the Troy's hoo-ha. The pipe, like, yeah, in the middle exactly. Of the night. Straight up the pipe. Uh, and then uh, option three, which is which is gross. Um, so apparently, um, stingrays can, uh, after collecting the specimen from the male, just kind of hold on to that, the lady cave, for a while. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
Uh, now the problem oh, yeah. with that the the problem with that is the last time that this could have happened was eight years ago. So I mean, if that stingray can keep that stuff fresh for eight years, uh, that's just impressive. Man, there's whew, well, that's a. I like a, the way you phrased all of that. It was very <laughs> like you were talking to a child or an old person and you didn't want to say certain words. I'm a big fan of Lady Cave. Lady Cave. Lady I'm imagining Cave. the Stingray went back to her like little house and like pulled uh-huh. like a sample that she had stashed in like her freezer. Like I, I think it's I think it's time to warm this up. I think Lady Cave is the name of my band. <laughs> Excellent. Perfect. Yeah, have you guys so ever uh, Go ahead. Have you guys ever watched You're the Worst? I've never even I have not. That. I've I've been recommended to watch that, but I have not. Okay. There's there's like a well, if you plan on watching it, I don't want to ruin it, but there's a there's something similar that happens in that show that's very upsetting. <laughs> uh but anyway, that's the uh the fun story uh, that reminded me of Star Trek. Um I'm sure there's some episode of Star Trek that is similar to that last situation. I just couldn't think of it, but uh, the first two certainly reminded me of it. I don't know, y'all. Um Chris has got this like uh, sexy voice vibe going on, kind of like Phoebe and Friends. So it's the sexy flam, yes. I think exactly. it's working. Uh oh, watch out! She might be stashing something in her lady cave soon. <laughs> <laughs> oh god! <laughs> oh, god. Oh, god. <laughs> yes. Uh, strike one, killing Chris. <laughs> All right. Oh. Okay, well, so this week we are doing an episode called Judgment. And before we begin, just as a kind of like like a pre a pre warm up, every type every Star Trek series has had like the courtroom drama episode, and this so is some, some multiple times. Yes. Se- most of them, I think, have several. Um, this yeah. so this is yeah. one of Enterprises. And um, we open on a Klingon court, which is basically just triangles. Like, it's the most triangular room you can imagine is the Klingon court. It, it was funny because when we first saw the set, I was like, is this the same courtroom from like when Q puts Picard on trial? But I don't think so. No, that one was square. Mm. Yeah, it is the same. It is a, it is the it's effectively the same courtroom as out of Star Trek um, six. It's it's funny. I don't want to get too Which, much into yes, it. Yes, I know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, my 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 deep dive goes into that. But yeah, they reused a lot of assets mm-hmm. for, for that. Um, the only asset they didn't reuse, as far as I could tell, is Michael Dorn. <laughs> so, uh, th- yes, and... Um, <laughs> they're like there's only one punishment for Klingon court I assume it's babysitting because like babysitting Klingons <laughs> would be the worst based on like the, the the Klingon children we've seen it would be terrible yeah um oh poor Alexander um <laughs> he was but like, shit it, don't you it, say poor Alexander <laughs> <laughs> uh but anyways Archer's being hauled up in front of Klingon court and we get some faith of the heart uh coming back from the credits uh we get to the like the 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 Klingon jail cell that Archer's being held in, which is basically like a medieval Klingon jail. They don't they don't they have like advanced starships and warp capabilities, but all their jails are just like f- torchlight and fucking honks of meat and bars. Yeah, yeah. haunches of raw meat that still have fur on them. Doctor Flox is is coming to check on uh, Archer to uh, to kind of make sure he's all right. It is not mentioned how the Klingons managed to get a hold of Archer. Um, his face is kind of bruised. So there's an implication that he was, whatever it was, involved yeah. some punching. Like not at any point in the episode is it mentioned. Actually. It is not. It is nope. very, and they like, it is so not mentioned that they even mentioned the fact that it is not mentioned in that memory alpha article. Yeah. Because, like, they escape from their scenario that they describe later. <laughs> but there's, like, nothing that's there. I guess yeah. at some point he just turned himself in. I, this is, no, he's this is all what happens up. when you... This is what happens when you in media res too hard. I, I think it's fine, to be honest. Like, I don't think it was a bad choice. It was fine. But, by the way, I like the establishing shot for the, uh... For the, you know, the prison. The little... CG shot they had coming in. I thought that was some some deep. Oh yeah, the the, the 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 Klingon judicial center there. Yeah, mm-hmm. which is like a there castle. Was a lot of 
There was a lot of good CGI this episode. The mm-hmm. the battle, the ship, the really ship good. CGI was pretty good. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, the I'm not gonna lie that that fucking leg of Targ looked fucking delicious. I don't know if I was just particularly hungry at that moment. <laughs> uh, but it was a little like furry a, for me. But yeah, well, you just eat, eat the other side of it. Um, and Archer's, uh, I guess, like court empire appointed advocate with his food Klingon chew facial hair shows up. Yeah, old J.G. Hertzler. He's uh, Martok from DS9. Yes, he is. And uh, he's like, I'm going to be your advocate. And he's like, basically, (laughs) your entire job is to shut the fuck up and not say anything. And Archer's (laughs) like, I'm going to fail at that immediately. (laughs) I don't know if you know me. I'm really bad at that. Um, We get into the Klingon courtroom and I can only describe it as like, it's the price is right. Or like the, the lawyering, the courtroom scene from idiocracy. Like there's a lot of audience participation in this courtroom. They really like banging their sticks. And yeah. yeah. Uh, do you think those, and I actually had this as a note. Do you think those are their own like stomping sticks or do you think the court owns them and they just grab them out of a basket on their way in? It's court supplied. Or just like, no, they're, they're tucked into the, the, the like niches in the back oh, of the pews. Do you think like, do you think like real like pro court goers have their own ones, but then like the real, like the amateur ones like, just like use bowlers. the. Like bowlers. Yeah. Yeah. Like pool, like pool cues or, or whatever. Pool, pool yeah. cues. Yeah, exactly. I think it's like a basketball game where like they've got that random person running around, like handing out thunder sticks for everybody. Mm, do you think it costs mm. more to have like a louder stick? <laughs> It's got like fucking LED lights on it. And shit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there was a while in basketball games. I don't know if they still do this, where they had these like inflatable tubes that you would bang into each other and they were loud as shit. Yeah, they still yeah, that's the thunder sticks. Oh, yeah. those are thunder sticks. Oh, okay. I didn't realize that's yeah, what yeah. those were called. Okay. Yeah. A very loud name for, for two inflatable plastic tubes. That you They're surprisingly <laughs> loud. Yeah. They, uh, at basketball games, they put them behind the, uh, the baskets. So when the other team's taking the foul shots, you yeah. right. together to distract him. Yep. Right, right, right. Um, so anyways, uh, the, 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 the audience at the Klingon court is having a fucking great time. Um, they keep calling it a tribunal. However, I don't know that the writers of this episode know what a tribunal actually is because it seems like it's just the one dude making all the decisions and doing everything. There's like one judge and that no, is see, it's, uh, it's try because it's a triangle. It's yeah. tribunal. <laughs> it's yeah, you the, got the two peanut galleries and the judge. Like, right, because like, because the thing that they're basing it on is the the courtroom scene in Star Trek uh, f- uh, Six, but like in that one, if you like, they camera angle to clearly three judges who were up at the top, like being in charge of the actual tribunal. So it feels like. It feels like they called it the tribunal because they know it's the Klingon tribunal, but they didn't actually have any actors up there, so they just had the one judge. See, Colos was successful in his mission that we'll learn about later in the episode. Mm. Uh, Then we get a flashback because um, the prosecution Klingon, um, he comes out and he's like, "Uh, I've got a witness, and the witness, (laughs) he like... He used to be the, the captain of a battle cruiser, but now he's been demoted to like a gunnery sergeant or whatever the fuck they called him. Um, and he's like, uh, oh, that sucks for you, dipshit. So tell us what <laughs> happened. And he's like, well, who's that guy? And so we get this flashback of like what the Klingons saw Archer uh-huh. do. And it's like. I get what they were trying to do. I get that they were trying to make Archer look menacing because, like, it's from the Klingons' perspective. Earth Battle Cruiser. The, yeah, but they did. A, they did it. They did a real bad job. Um, the the there is a Klingon woman aboard the uh, the 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 Klingon cruiser, and their uniforms are. I don't know. They're just really low cut for no apparent reason. So you know, it's like suns out, guns out, ships out, tits out. It's that's how it works. I guess, but like the male uniform, if the male uniforms were also cut with a deep, like hairy V, like fine. Okay. <laughs> but the males get fucking turtlenecks and the women's are just, just complete boobs out the entire time. Yeah. They gotta, they gotta be ready. I don't know, man. The Klingons seem like they're having a hard time talking through their teeth. 
Uh, and then we get some pretty good. That's, su- I don't know. Have you watched Star Trek? That's I know it's every so Star funny. Trek it's ever. So funny. And actually, Michael Dorn, if I understand it correctly, like he had the teeth for the first few episodes, and then he was like, "I'm not doing these fucking teeth," and then he just dropped them. So Martok was uh, like, he's like, we're certainly like less than other Klingons mm-hmm. in DS9 for sure, because he has more speaking parts and. As you noted, it's stupid to, to try to talk through those teeth. Yeah, because it's hard. I, I read something where Michael Dorn said that uh, during talking where it was up close, uh, like on his face, he would wear the teeth because the Klingons are supposed to have funny teeth. But if he wasn't the center of a shot or it wasn't like a, a tight shot on him, um, he wouldn't wear them. And there's apparently a couple of times in TNG where you can see where they forgot to tell him to put his teeth back in and he <laughs> just has normal teeth while he's talking. Amazing. Yeah. Uh, so there's some pretty good space fighting. The Enterprise is going to go high. And, and so, okay, so the whole premise is that the Enterprise is, the the accusation is that the that Archer and his crew were uh, assisting rebels to the Empire because they were helping some rebels. And the rebels, they, Archer is claiming that they were not rebels, they were refugees because they were starving, because the Empire kind of robbed them of their food. And so they were just helping out a ship in need. They were not rebels. They were not fomenting a rebellion or any of that shit. Go ahead, Chris. Oh, I was just going to note that the the witness was named Duras, which famously a a well-respected name in in Star Trek. Yes. Um, So the, in the, in Duras's little flashback here, the enterprise and them start going toe to toe. The enterprise goes and hides in the ring system of a, of a planet. They hide behind like a particularly large asteroid. Then they fire a missile around the other side of the asteroid. And it, it takes a right in kind of a weird way. So my note here is like, Oh, this little missile is just going to scoonch on by this asteroid here. Hey, missiles two weeks in a row. Not sucky. Yeah. This missile did not suck. (laughs) Yeah. The Klingon ship is exploding, but they're still shooting at the enterprise as they're going down. Cause they're so fucking metal. God, I love Klingons. They're amazing. Um, so stupid. And, uh, and then we get out of the, we get out of the, uh, we get out of the, uh, the flashback with the, with Duras looking kind of chagrined. He's like, and then I got demoted. And the prosecutor's like, like, you're lucky you weren't executed for being so shitty at your job, dumbass. maybe, Maybe suck less. I mean, come on. Um, and then, uh, the audience is like, boo, boo, fuck you, Archer. And, um. Duh. Oh yeah! Instead of a regular gavel, they use this like sparky sphere thing. I vote I think it's all so cool. judges should use that. <laughs> yeah, man, think, it's so, so awesome. I have a question about it. Do you think the metal gauntlet, like, is that is that part of it, or was this Klingon just supposed to have like a metal hand? <laughs> I, I think it's I, a I gauntlet think, he wore. Yeah, I, I think it was just part of the judge's garb. I don't. Mm. I don't think that was what was sparking it. I think but, the spark was like the ball onto right, right. like the so round surface. Do we think that the gauntlet and the ball are like one unit that he just sticks oh, yeah. his hand in? Yeah. Okay. Yes. All right. Yeah, That's yeah. what I was thinking. The whole gavel is just the gauntlet with the sphere. Yeah. Yeah. So much better than just a tiny little hammer. Come on. <laughs> yeah. My note here for act two is this lawyer is like, dude, just like, don't be stupid, I guess. I'm not sure what that was specifically in context to. Um, but the Klingons in this court seem weirdly like to not give a shit about honor. They're just like, bah, fuck a bear. Yeah, I did have that thought. I'm like, this kind of, this whole uh, thing departs from the normal Klingon honor stuff. Well, like, I feel like that happens a lot in Star Trek though. Like there's always the Klingons that show up that don't really display honor and it's part of the problem. Right. They take a recess and like this, like decades old Klingon lawyer needs Archer to give him some sort of inspirational speech to be a better Klingon lawyer. I don't know. It's fucking stupid. No, no. He specifically wasn't a warrior. He, they had a whole conversation about how not everybody's a warrior. In Klingon I didn't society. say warrior. I said lawyer. He's a decades old Klingon lawyer. Oh, I didn't but, hear it. I, but for I some reason, warrior. but for some reason, Archer has to inspire him to be a better lawyer. It's fucking stupid. Like he's he's been doing this for longer than Archer's been like an adult. Yeah, but but plot, shut up. So that lawyer, anyways, Archer's advocate comes out and cites a charter, and it's all this big moment because he cited the shit out some charter. Um, 
and then they call Archer as a witness for himself. The audience does not care for that. That was strikes. That was marks against the audience on that. Mm. This is where I'm like, I don't like that they showed us like what really happened when Archer was giving his flashback. I wanted like an Archer tinged flashback Mm. where like Archer is like 10 years younger and has muscles (laughs) and like, like flowing hair and shit. (laughs) I, I have a more makes important, out with him. I have a more important qualm with all of this. Mm-hmm. How are there like zero recordings of what happened to be submitted into evidence? Reasons. Shut up. Like it was the, this it was is the, it was the magic torpedo that knocked everything out. But like both of these arguments are entirely hearsay. There's no actual evidence like in any of these court proceedings. It's just. It, it seems really weird in like a sci-fi era that there's even an argument about what really happened. So anyways, um, <laughs> <laughs> like it's a good, it's a good point. Like it, it's a very good point. Why wasn't there just a recording of like all of the communication logs and shit? Like they talked back and forth a couple times. Like yep. Archer's versions of the events are quote, we hailed them. There were three of them with the woman having her big old titties hanging out. Like, Mm-hmm. There's kind of this weird camera shot in there that's like Archer's really making sure to let everyone in the court know about this lady's this lady's cleavage. Um, had, Enterprise had again, to get the horniness in there somewhere. But then, like the the actual accounting of like other than the actual communications, the CGI fighting the is pretty much the same. They yeah. shoot at each other a couple times, go behind the asteroid, scooch on a little missile out there, and blow up some shit. Yeah, except you know, obviously Archer attacks first in, in Duras's version. Then yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so, uh, Archer's, uh, advocate gets like a closing speech and his closing speech is like, yeah, my client is guilty, which is a bold strategy. Of meddling. And then I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, he's guilty of being a meddling little douche nozzle. <laughs> um, and, uh, but he's like, yeah, but he's like, he's, he's, he's not a bad guy. Like he helped out when we needed that one dude brought back and then he'd saved that raptor from the gas giant and, you know. Sure, he's a douche, but whatever. I say, is that a crime? <laughs> is it a crime to be a douche? Apparently. And so, uh, so that they're on recess while the judge is deciding, and it's like he usually doesn't take this long. I must be better at this than I thought, which is a very funny line out of the advocate. <laughs> and uh, th- this is where we had this conversation about like he's like you weren't a soldier, and he's like no, I've been a lawyer my whole life. Like you didn't think all Klingons were soldiers, and. How do we not believe that? Like every single fucking Klingon anyone's ever met has always been like, I'm a warrior. Like, fuck you. Yes, we did think you were all soldiers. I mean, somebody had to invent stuff. They get back in and uh, they're like, oh, you've put on a good defense, much to the surprise of this tribunal, which is fucking harsh. Like, God <laughs> damn. You old fuck. And this guy single handedly finds the accused guilty. Turns out that indeed being a douche is a crime in the Klingon Empire because he's basically sentenced to being an asshole and uh, <laughs> or, uh, uh, yeah, accused of being an asshole and is sentenced to uh, to uh, the minds of uh, whatever the fucking name of that shit is. Um, it's like this cold dilithium mine. It was in Star Trek six. Chris is going to talk more about it. Yeah, Chris is going to talk about more about it later. The uh, so the judge is like, you're guilty, but we're going to commute your death sentence and you have to go work in the mines. The prosecutor's like, oh, your honor, I want him dead now. <laughs> and the judge is like, what the fuck, dude, you won. Fuck off. Then it feels like we're directly in Star Trek six because then we go to the cold mine. They don't have a sexy shapeshifter to get them out, though. So they just kind of start mining. <laughs> Archer and his ad- his advocate also get sentenced to to the mines because he was like, this is stupid. And the judge is like, well, you can join him. So <laughs> so Archer and his advocate are basically like chatting while they're mining this dilithium. And then this guard comes up and goes, our ships run on dilithium, not talk. And he like zaps them. <laughs> yep. You know, with a stun baton. He's been working on that zinger for a while. He's glad he finally got to got to pull that one out. He's been workshopping that with his buddies down at the in the in the break room. Mm-hmm. The Enterprise figures out where he is thanks to some uh you know diplomatic pull that 
uh, to Paul had with some some vague Klingon officiants. Um, he officials. was talking about like the one guy in the establishing shot who's very clearly not mining. Just like pretending to hit the wall so obviously. Oh no, I missed that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. It's like it's in the when it when it's tightening in on like the new people coming in that Reed comes in on. It's like this guy's like mining at the wall, and it like doesn't even even remotely look like he's actually hitting oh, the wall. That's amazing. Ah, uh, yes, yeah, so the Enterprise finds them. They send Reed in to get them out because, of course, they do. Reed's like, let's go, and Archer's like, can you bring my advocate too? And Reed's like, sure, and the advocate's, no, you inspired me, I'm gonna serve out my sentence here, and then I'm gonna hopefully work towards a better system. And Archer's like, good luck with that, motherfucker, and him and Reed take off, and the show cuts with, like, that Klingon, like, kind of old man digging, and carrying some, like, ice, and my final note is, <laughs> uh, he'll be dead within a week. It's fucking like, there's no way that man's going to make it. He he looks so old and it's day two. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the episode. Um, We like to rate these on a scale from one to five, where zero is threshold. I gave it a two and I feel like I was being a little generous. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So... Like, I I think I landed at a two here. And it's like they tried to make one of the good courtroom shows from Star Trek without actually having, like, a good subject or, like, narrative to explore at all. Yeah, yeah, there's no ethical dilemma here at all. It's purely a, 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 like, these people... And their corrupt system They're saw something Myth. different. And yeah. Archer and the good guy are like, no, but that's not right. Ugh. That was just helping. Like, yeah, no, there's no, it wasn't exploring. It wasn't exploring like humanity or anything like that at all. Like, you know, the data courtroom episode is a next generation and, and you know, or like Yuna and, in, uh, with the, with the genetic, uh, worlds, yeah. Yeah. right. Mm-hmm. It's, like, it's just, it's frustrating it's like, because it, it seems like this happens over and over again with Enterprise. They, I feel like they're working from this formula of the like, check in the box. Oh, courtroom drama. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, th- this is what makes a good Star Trek series. Here's this episode. And then, you know, it goes to the writer room and somebody's like, yeah, we don't want to make an arc out of this. It's got to be done in, you know, 44 minutes or whatever. So they just, they rush it out. There's no build up. There's no like character drama. It's just And you know, here's the thing too, like like there are two different kinds of courtroom scenes in Star Trek. It's like the 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 we're making some kind of ethical moral dilemma, like the the the, the we were just talking about, like the data and the Uno one. And there's also the like falsely accused that we have to prove innocent. And those are always like investigative episodes. Right. It's more detective work than the actual courtroom scene. Right. This one was trying to be the latter, but didn't do any actual investigating. (laughs) Yeah. It like, that's, that's what this felt like. It felt like just the shitty parts of the The other two episode. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I feel like it would have been better off if they just had, instead of having like, um, flashbacks to, the incident between the two ships, they should have had flashbacks to the courtroom. And then the interesting part of the episode be them rescuing Archer from this dilithium, you know, mining camp. Oh, start in media res at the, at the mining camp. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. And then like, navigating, it still would have been shitty, you know, but like <laughs> maybe a little better. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's just, it's one of those situations where like, you know, they like famously cut Tom Bobadil out of the Lord of the Rings movies because in the end, Thank it God. didn't really matter. That's how this whole court system felt. Like, in the end, it didn't matter because no matter what, Archer was going to get, um, you know, thrown in a dilithium camp. Right. So, move on. <laughs> right. That, that's a good point. Like, we didn't need any of this because the, the actual resolution to the plot had nothing to do with the courtroom. Right. Yeah. That's a good point, Rob. So what do you give it? You didn't actually give us a number. Two. Uh, Not the worst. Um, definitely worse than standard Trek. Yeah, I mean, 
it, exactly like it's it's it, it wasn't good um but it wasn't like horrendously awful it had jg hertzler who's was a fun callback but yeah not as bad as Marauders, apparently. We all agree. <laughs> oh, Marauders is oh, terrible. <laughs> Dude, that whole bit where they were just shuffling or along the perimeter. <laughs> oh god, what a fucking dumb episode. <laughs> uh that's uh all right, folks. Well, we will be back with a deep dive after a little tiny break. Welcome back. So to, for today's deep dive, um, I ain't going to do it. Uh, so Chris and I both thought we were doing the summer this week because um, a little peek behind the curtain. We don't plan very well when we're doing this. <laughs> <laughs> now, it turns out I was correct. I was the one who was supposed to do the summary, but Chris had prepared a deep dive and I hadn't actually prepared mine yet. So I'm going to let him go ahead and take care of the deep dive. So um Ladies and gentlemen, Chris Emmerich. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> All right. Thank you, sir. So, yeah. So, uh, for the deep dive, I wanted to kind of explore some of the history behind Ruripenthe, which is the, the, the lithium mining colony that Archer and uh, and Kolos got sent to in this episode. It, of course, first appeared in uh, uh, Star Trek VI, um, The Undiscovered Country. Um the first Star Trek I saw in the theater. Was it really? That was actually, yep. I think it was the, the second Star Trek like movie I watched. That it was, was like, the first Star Trek movie I watched. Is it really? Uh, first one well, was like, on. As I said, because it came out in, was it like 91, right? Was, was yes. Undiscovered Country? Okay. Somewhere around there. Yeah. So it was about that time when we were kids and, and we were able to watch these things. So it just happened to come out at that time. Um, first I want to talk about some of the, the filming that went into the Enterprise episode since we're just talking about it, but then I want to explore that further with, uh, with what went into Star Trek VI filming, which is pretty interesting. I, I ended up looking more into it. Thank you, uh, Memory Alpha. You were great. Had so much information in there, I guess, from the various, you know, behind the scenes commentaries and, and, and whatnot from various DVDs and streaming services. Oh, and all yeah. That. I mean, that's 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 early 90s, man. Like, laser discs and shit. Oh, yeah. they were loving extra commentaries. Yeah. So, um, uh, the established shot of Rupenthe in Judgment, this episode of Enterprise, was not reused footage from Star Trek VI, which surprised me. I was um, wondering, yeah. Yeah, it, was, it, w it wasn't even a stock shot. It was apparently, um, uh, it was a new effect shot, um, probably stock shot over a stock shot from somewhere of an ice field. Uh, but they, you know, they didn't like go and like film it anywhere, but it was effects over like a stock ice field, which I thought was interesting. Um, was it laid out the same? Uh, interestingly, getting to that, the task of recreating Repente for Enterprise was uh, was done uh, with the help of David Trotty, who was one of the assistant directors on uh, on Judgment, but also worked on Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country. Oh, that's um, cool. Yeah. Jesus Christ. Okay, okay, hold on. Why the fuck wasn't that the episode then? Like, why <laughs> wasn't it the whole episode in Repente? That's a good question. That's what I'm saying, man. I know, Rob, you're completely correct. <laughs> um, for Ruripenthe's appearance in Enterprise, the uh, the tunnel-like mining area was filled with rock salt, which gave the illusion of ice. Mm. Uh, the episode's call sheet for that day apparently instructed people to wear old shoes so they wouldn't destroy valuable footwear and avoid contact with their eyes. Despite that, during the filming of the uh, little fight scene with the guards um, in, the, in the little, you know, mining tunnel... Uh, Scott Bakula accidentally got a face full of yes. rock salt. Good. Fuck you. <laughs> which, oh, God. Which, uh, which went into his mouth and eyes, uh, but was washed out with eye wash and he was fine. Yeah, it's uh, salt. Oh, like, he'll be God, right. that must have burned so bad, I'm sure though. it did not feel great. Um, the, re the recreated Ruripenthe also incorporated some of the same dilithium crystal rocks, many examples of wardrobe and lots of Klingon weapons that were included in the film version of Ruripenthe. Interesting. Um, uh, uh, there's a quote from J.J. Hertzler about working in the environment of the faux mine uh, with Scott Bakula. He said, we were carrying large chunks of dilithium ore and it was heavy. Uh, he recollected that it was huge chunks of mica uh, and walking in Klingon boots over ground filled with rock salt and mica and everything else. It was hell just a 
to keep from breaking ankles. So no wonder he wasn't a Klingon warrior. Ooh. Goddamn. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> we filming. Jesus. Um, all of Rorpente's scenes in judgment were filmed at a single day and the set was dismantled by strike crews on the following day. The salt from the Rorpente set was reused to, to simulate snow in a, amid chilly Arctic environs in an upcoming episode, uh, regeneration. So fun stuff there. Um, getting to the original Rorpente in Star Trek six, um, of course, when uh, Kirk and McCoy were sentenced to life on Rorapente after being found guilty of the assassination of Chancellor Gorkon. Mm. Ah, poor Gorkon. Gone, gone, gone too soon. Mm, yeah, poor, poor Gorkon. It's a weird name to say, Gorkon. Mm. Um, so, of course, in an effort to ensure their deaths, it was arranged for, uh, is it, was it Martia or Marcia? I was reading it. I'm like, I, I couldn't remember how it was pronounced in the movie. Uh, who? The, the shape changer. Jeez, I don't remember. Camelot. Anyway, um, she's supposed to help them escape, providing motive for the Klingons to forces on the surface to kill him. Um, of course, that was found out in, in Kirk and McCoy escape uh, with help of Spock and the crew of the Enterprise. Um, although early consideration was given to depicting uh, a prison on the Klingon homeworld in Star Trek VI, you know, the discovered country, uh, this concept became a separate Klingon penal asteroid. Uh, what happened was that they felt that in terms of budget, recreating the entire planet would be impossible, so it became uh, a more prison concept, uh, which which was from Mark Rosenthal, who was a co-writer of the film story. At first, Star Trek VI screenplay co-writer um, Denny Martin Flynn conceived of the location as a foul-smelling planet um, on an undeveloped world, uh, which he referenced as a third-world country, ouch, with an overcrowded... Oh alien populace and a blisteringly hot environment of about a thousand degrees. Oh, so they went the exact opposite of all of that then. The the reason is fun. Not maybe fun's not the right word, but, but stupid. Uh, (laughs) Um, Flynn recalled that we simply wrote most of the scenes as they were. And then at some point after that, um, one of the producers, Nick Meyer conceived the idea that it would be an ice planet. Uh, Meyer, the other co-writer of the screenplay for Star Trek VI, added that it was actually the result of a Paramount executive, David Kirkpatrick. Um, it was a sand planet, and he said, I'm tired of hot desert planets. Can we do something else? <laughs> and the only thing <laughs> else I could think of was an ice planet. Good job. The two biomes, hot <laughs> and all ice. Options. <laughs> hot and cold. Um, so, uh, where was I? Oh, yeah. Uh, there's some notes about... Um, Screen, various Star Trek screenwriters criticizing the concept of Repenthe's dilithium mining facility in Star Trek VI, uh, remarking about how it's kind of silly to have these, you know, miners with their pickaxes trying to mine down lithium when they clearly have, you know, replicators and and advanced mining equipment they could use it to actually mine the dilithium, which is a very re- valuable resource in the Star Trek universe. See, and like I had assumed that it was basically like. Yeah, this is just bullshit work this, to give them to do. Like, this is just to make them suffer, yeah. Yeah, like... <laughs> um, some of the surface scenes of Rurapente in Star Trek Six were actually filmed on location in Colony Glacier in Alaska. Oh, in Rurapente? Oh, okay. <laughs> um, the footage included the first shot of uh, Rurapente in Star Trek Six, establishing the icy, you know, planet surface. Uh, additionally, filmed in Alaska was some of the footage of the um, icicle covered body that Kirk and, and, you know, the brute version of, of the shape changer lady um, pass on the surface. Uh, the location, which was only reachable by a helicopter, was scouted by uh, the second team filming unit two months before the filming. Uh, apparently, merely as a precaution, um, they took fake snow with them uh, as the weather was pretty unpredictable and sure enough there was no snow there when they got there so they had to use their fake snow uh, for <laughs> the filming. Use, they use their fake snow for shooting on scene on a glacier in alaska yes. uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> um the location shoot was apparently extremely challenging for those involved uh not only the the second unit crew but also stand-ins for the performances of who appears in the relevant scenes because of course you know kirk and spock's actors you know uh, are, are going to be actually doing those shots in, in fucking glacier in Alaska. Uh, it was two and a half days of very intense second unit work on a glacier, which uh, normally would have taken a week and a half or two weeks to shoot. 
They were getting up at four in the morning, driving an hour, and flying an hour in a helicopter. They had a crew of 30 and four helicopters, just making that for a couple days. Um, despite the initial absence of snow, the weather provided um, <clears throat> other difficulties. It said it was 22 degree, degrees below zero when they got there in the morning and 50 by two o'clock in the afternoon. So, Jesus. I'm sure fun when you're in full makeup and in wardrobe and everything like that. Um, said, yeah, it was like 10 degrees and we'd had one stunt man in about three and a half hours of very heavy makeup. Um, these are the various guys commenting on, uh, on, on the shoot. Um, but if you're one of the stuntmen wearing those wool costumes, it was apparently really bad. I mean, wool in those conditions, woof. Um, mm. perfect situation for getting pneumonia. So is what they said. <laughs> um, Apparently, the Alaskan weather was so cold that batteries uh, used for the cameras for the filming, uh, among other equipment, worked for only a few minutes before they needed to be replaced. So, wee! Jesus Christ. Yeah. The, uh, the Star Trek surface scenes that involved cast were shot on Paramount sound stages, which included the set for the campsite. Uh, the exterior shots filmed inside also involved close-up shots of Kirk and McCoy and, and the shape changer as they travel across the, the surface. Um, one of the sound stages used for repent the exteriors was um, Paramount Stage 15, which housed a massive set with, filled with fake snow. Uh, according to David Trotty, um, it involved uh, that the kind of the blizzard conditions involved four uh, big wind machines blowing shaved plastic at them. Um, the director <laughs> of uh, photography here on Narita, uh, said uh, since they had to use large fans to create the blizzard effect, they were quite concerned about fake snow getting into the camera and it was profuse. William Shatner um, had commented that he recalled it permeated every orifice. The wind machines drove it with full force into every crevice so that you never knew where the white stuff was going to come out. <laughs> and generally, it came out of your nose and your mouth. But there were all, there were all kinds of effects. You didn't want to go home at night because you frightened your family. Um, just... Mm, just white Ew. plastic shoved up your nose and other things. All right, gather around, kids. So, Let's see where this plastic comes out of daddy today. <laughs> it's like microplastic, no macroplastics. Yep. So the snowfield was apparently constructed from styrofoam that produced the clunking sound anytime the actors walked, walked across it. Um, they commented, uh, or here to read of the, the the guy who did cinematography said he thinks the special effects people used two kinds of snow, soap flakes and potato flakes, which mm. is different than the plastic that's previously referenced. So I'm not sure. Um, the actual underground prison of Ruripente was actually filmed at Bronson Canyon Caves in Griffith Park in Los Angeles, California, which I thought was interesting because that park, Bronson Canyon in particular, is used for a number of various episodes of, Star, of various Star Treks. Uh, is it uh, all of the episodes that are mentioned in the caves episode of Lower Decks? Probably. Uh, let's see. Uh, this side of Paradise was filmed there. Of course, the Star Trek sixes. Uh, Darmok uh, for TNG was filmed there. Um, Ensign Row was filmed there. Um, Bronson Canyon was used um, for the uh, in where they did the digital effect of Voyager landing on a planet one time. So it's, it's, it's well used in the Star Trek universe, which I thought was interesting. That's cool. Um, the set for the prison was built as an open air construct in an area that was just outside the cave and, um, was bounded by fairly steep flint rocks. Uh, from the perspective of actually being there during the location shoot, uh, David Trotty explained, uh, Nick Meyer and art director, uh, Herman Zimmerman, uh, chose to shoot under the open sky in the narrow gorge of Bronson Canyon. Because it's the only place to achieve the sense of scale, Nick wants for the mines close enough to the studio to accommodate the needs of makeup and hair. <laughs> Funny the things that these come down to. Yeah, because in the movie, the interior shots of the caves, they're not like ice caves. They're just rocks. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so filming in Bronson Canyon also accommodated the huge underground labyrinth described in the script. Uh a set that was too high to have been contained on a stage while still allowing the production crew to control the lighting of the sets. Uh, in retrospect, Trotty explained prior to getting up there, our art department went up and they spray painted the walls of the Canyon white to look like ice. They built huge bridges. We had the Klingons out there and we went out and shot for about four or five nights. And then we came back down. Um, 
the elevator design uh, was designed simply, which is kind of an old old film trick. A belt of rock textured rubber was moved upwards by rollers in the background, giving the impression that the elevator in the foreground was plummeting downward. Um, explained Herman Zimmerman. Indeed, we used something that they've been using since the silent film days. Fiberglass rocks glued onto a piece of canvas that's being cranked around, so it looks like they're ascending or descending into the mine. Oh. Practical effects are so funny and like that it's like when you hear them described yeah yeah it's just like that's so stupid how does that's, it work how does that fucking work <laughs> how are our brains so stupid as to not figure that shit out right so that's coming to the sun of the background before uh about uh Ruripenthe and star trek six so I, I just had a lot of fun reading through these these various details of what went into the filming of that when you know you watch it it's like oh yeah it's you know i'm sure it's on a stage but there's so much more that goes into it yeah um, a couple or one last quick note it did uh Ruripenthe is actually referenced in a deleted scene of 2009 star trek the the calvin timeline movie um in which a deleted scene from the film shows that nero and his crew from the narada were captured by the klingons and imprisoned on Ruripenthe for 25 years after their ship was crippled by the uss kelvin in 2233 the attack on the prison planet referenced in the film was Nero and his crew escaping from Ruripenthe and reclaiming their vessel. For the prison hmm. planet's appearance in the deleted scene, Ruripenthe designs were created by concept artist James Klein, and some location filming was undertaken at a redressed industrial site. Huh. Almost made it into that Star Trek film. Too. Almost made it into the alternate timeline. Yep. So yeah, that is some of the fun history of Rupenthe in Star Trek. Um, there were some other minor notes too. Like it's apparently like referenced in a bunch of like background images of like star charts. It's like noted as like a Klingon, you know, territory thing. It just says Rupenthe, but uh, nothing actually spoken of. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, I showed um, I showed Liam uh, Star Trek Six not too long ago, like a month ago. Um, mm -hmm. He liked it. Um, that's a fun one. That's the, that's the one. I don't know if y'all remember when I was talking about how anti-gravity works in Star Trek. That is the movie where anti-gravity, like the gravity plates failing is this right. the first time it's ever happened on, on screen. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I remember that. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Fun stuff. Well, that'll wrap up my deep dive. Uh, when we come back, uh, Stanford will have a mystery, uh, potpourri for us. Uh, yeah, I sure Ooh. will. <laughs> and maybe, maybe, maybe a mystery for him. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> Welcome back. So, um, my original idea for Potpourri was to have Rob and Chris um, both take sides of a legal ethical debate as if they were lawyers on a Star Trek show. Um, but given that Chris's voice is at the limit of its taxation tonight, I don't want to be too mean. <laughs> <laughs> so, Back uh, up your, your points there. That might be the only cough I leave in. Um, <laughs> um, so um, instead, I will have pulled out the old shuttle pod Galileo. Oh, speaking of which, hold on. I got I got two things. So I watched Star Trek Liam today. And I watched Voyager and I watched some Prodigy. Chris, have you watched more of Prodigy yet? I think I've watched what All of was it? available on Paramount before did you, it moved. Did you watch the one where they went to the planet and it was like these aliens that were cosplaying as Starfleet? Yes, I did watch the, that. The yes. Starflight episode? Yeah, uh-huh. Yeah, so good. Liam had already seen it, but they were like, da, 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 the Gallo, and I'm like, the Gallows, and I'm like, oh, it's a Galileo shuttlecraft. Oh, it was an ensign. Oh, he's like, how do you know? I'm like, Liam, the show is for <laughs> children. Like, <laughs> But the other thing, too, is we were watching Voyager, and um, in one episode, like, there's this random bridge member that you've never seen before. His name is Lieutenant Durst, and he's got, like, Fred? a bunch of lines in that episode and it's like who the fuck is this guy do i not remember this guy yeah that's lieutenant, the designated red shirt lieutenant durst he's not a red shirt he's fucking lieutenant like he's just like he's like a bridge guy and he like has all these lines the next episode is the episode where like they go to the vidian like penal colony and oh, durst is with them and i'm like murdered. oh that's right that's why i don't remember durst because he's about to have his <laughs> face taken <laughs> Oh, poor Durst. Oh, poor Durst. Poor Lieutenant Durst. So, yeah, that's what we watched today. This is, uh, 
I'm like, here you go, Liam. Watch this guy take this other dude's face. Face off. All right, Star Trek The Next Generation. Trip, trip, wow, yeah. these are fucking obscure. Oh, so anyway, so uh, yeah, I'm gonna pu- I pulled out the trivia cards. We're gonna do Star Trek The Next Generation trivia because we have not moved forward enough in Enterprise to um, actually generate some new trivia. So we'll probably do those at the end of next season. Um, so for now, uh, I tried to find one that uh, both Rob and Chris would have about an equal chance of doing okay in. Uh, I'm going to keep the score here and uh, we'll just do uh, you know, just shout them out. Uh, and first one to get it right, uh, we'll get the point. Sweet. All right, here we go. Which theoretical physicist played himself in a holographic poker, poker game with Data, Einstein, and Isaac Newton? Stephen Hawking. Stephen Hawking. Uh, I got Chris first. Oh. This stupid Montana. <laughs> What did Jordy want to visit on Deep Space Nine? In engineering? A hollow suite? A Katerian antique shop. Wow, sure. that is obscure. <laughs> I did not know. I didn't know that. Um, I knew that the Enterprise was on DS9 episodes. I did not know that a TNG episode had yeah, they, them at like DS9. One or two crossover episodes. Um, what Starfleet Academy squadron did Wesley Crusher join? Oh, oh crap. What did they call it? Shit. Uh, the Goonies. Nova Star? Oh, close enough that I'll give it to you, Chris. It was Nova Squadron. Nova Squadron. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh for a bonus point, who else was in that squadron? <laughs> <laughs> Tom Paris. <laughs> Tom Paris. <laughs> Yeah, doesn't that get, like, get brought up in Lower Decks at one point? Yeah, too? there's a whole episode where the, the that actor comes and plays him, and he's 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 Lucar- Lucarno, is that his name? Lucarno, yeah. Lucarno instead Nick, of Tom Nick Paris. Lucarno, yeah. Yeah. Um, and it, there's also, actually, there's a there's like another ensign who's Bajoran, who is in that squad, who um, who's in a, 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 an episode of Next Generation, who ends up like sacrificing herself for some Cardassian like double agent or something like that. That sounds about right. That's what Bajorans are for. <laughs> is yeah. for some Cardassian bullshit. Yeah. The only Cardass the only Bajoran on fucking Voyager ended up being a Cardassian. Like this is this is what Bajorans are for. <laughs> uh spoiler alert. <laughs> um <laughs> what name did the crew give the Borg drone they rescued? Q. Just shout him out when you get him, Rob. Just shout him right out. <laughs> oh, God. I believe Hugh is correct, because my dad always called that episode Me, You, and a Borg Named Hugh. Yep. What sort of cake did Deanna Troy become in Data's Nightmare? Lemon. That's a Rob, chocolate cake? think about it. I've... So, no, apparently not. I thought it was chocolate. Angel food cake? Oh, it was like some blue cake, wasn't it? Yeah, cellular peptide, leading him to oh, uncover... Oh, cellular peptide, that's right. It was like, I remember <laughs> listening to that. I'm like, what the fuck is a cellular The organisms that were consuming the peptides yeah. from the crew. Yeah, come on. Yeah. Obviously, boys. Jesus. Cellular peptide cake, that's right. What ship did Jordy LaForge's mother command? Oh. The know. Horizon. Wow. <laughs> I don't know. Got a lot of the right letters. It was the era. <laughs> Hera. The Hera. U.S. is Hera. All right. <clears throat> Who did Chief O'Brien marry? Keiko. Oh, God. Rob, if you can give me a last name, I'll give you the point instead. O'Brien. <laughs> <laughs> uh, shit, what was her list? <sighs> Keiko. It is incredibly Japanese, as may not surprise <sighs> you. I was thinking like Yoshizawa, but I don't think that's it. It is Ishikawa. Ishikawa. Okay. Ishikawa. I guess I better give Chris this, this point. I don't know what our mercy rule is here. But... <laughs> I think we've hit it. What hologram resembled the Old West? Oh, what hollow program resembled the Old West? Hollow Fucking... program? What? It, they had an Old West They had an old West hologram episode. Yeah, I remember. The, like, it was, it was Morph of, and Alexander and Deanna I believe Troy. it was the name of the town in that. Is the, I think it's the uh, titular town of that program. Uh, Tombstone? 
you're not. I mean, you're wrong, but like, <laughs> you've got the right idea. Yeah, I don't remember. It was Deadwood. Deadwood. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. What admiral did Picard report to, though he often clashed with her? Shit, what was her name? Not Forrest. I, I don't remember. Like, I remember the character, I don't remember her name. It's Russian. Petrov. It's Nechayev. Yeah, okay. Nechayev, okay. Nechayev, all right. Who temporarily hosted a Trill symbiote in order to complete a negotiation? Right, right. That's correct. Good job, Rob. Oh, I was going to let you finish the question, too. <laughs> <laughs> Rob, Rob gets to not do that. He's, he's, oh, wrecker. That is, a, that is not how I would have spilled symbiote. Symbiont? Symbiont, yeah. S I S Y M B I A N T. Yeah, that's how they spell no, it. No, it's O N T. Symbiont? The end. Yeah, it's weird. What was the son of Goal? I'm, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> what was the son of Goal? G O L? Gaul? Goal? Excuse me. What was the stone of Goal? Oh. Um. Was it like a communication device that like time traveled or something like that? Wow, not even close. Wasn't it, oh, wasn't it like a Vulcan thing? Maybe, but I'm going to need to know what it is. Like, what, what was its function? That was that thing that the, the pirate, it, it was the, um, oh, I don't remember her name, but I did a deep dive on, like, Romulan stuff. Um, she was like a Romulan in disguise, and she was looking for this thing, right? Is that what this is? I don't know. What don't does it so. do? It, it doesn't give me a synopsis of the episode. It just tells me what it does. It makes you a, a pleasant herbal tea. No. I don't remember. It is a psionic weapon. Sure. It attacked by amplifying a person's negative thoughts and emotions. That's dumb. Who captained the Enterprise D in the quantum reality where the Borg had conquered the Federation? Riker. Damn it, Rob. I was hoping you would shout Riker again. Uh, uh, <laughs> I'll do this last card. Maybe I should just let Rob have first stab at some of these. D- <laughs> oh, God. It's like, Rob, what makes the it's... ship go faster than light? <laughs> Is that what an was... actual question? No, it's not. No. Warp drive. <laughs> Dilithium crystals. <laughs> What was the name of Data's creator? Um. Oh wow, I was I was expecting. I know this one. Oh okay, I was like I was expecting Chris to get that right away because we watched Picard. Someone Noonien Singh. It's just Noonien Singh, Doctor Noonien Singh. Okay. Singh. Yeah. Yeah. Good job. Okay. I was Ooh. I was actually letting him have first stabs. So. Yeah, Thanks. no, no. Until he ties it back up, he gets first stabs. <clears throat> um. Who did Deanna Troy's sister accidentally drown? Jesus. Jesus. Remember this shit? Oh, um, where? Where did Deanna Troy's sister accidentally drown? What? In a pool, De- right? Deanna <laughs> Troy had a sister and she drowned somewhere. It was where? in a pool, right? So that is entirely incorrect. Huh. A, a bathtub. Okay. <laughs> B... More specific, but also less specific. Give me a place. <laughs> More specific, but the also. The ocean. Riza. I don't know. Earth. Ooh. Beta Z. Yes. See, it was a lake on, it was a lake on Beta Z. It was Lake Elmar on Beta Z. I don't think I get that point, though. No, neither of you do. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Rob. Who were the Maquis? Oh, man. They were the, the. Like the rebel, I mean, quote unquote, rebel faction that uh, wanted to inherit or inhabit territory that was later than claimed and annexed by the Cardassians. And the Federation said, we'll help you get you out. And they were like, no, fuck you guys. We're staying. And then diplomatic incident. Yes. The- I don't know if it was claimed by, it was given to in a peace deal by the Federation. Rebel the Federation colonists, they were opposed to the ceding of their home planets right. to the Cardassians. Yes, but yeah. I do, you got there with all that. Yeah. Well, actually, um, um, <laughs> and I feel like that's pretty good for not really having ever watched Voyager. Um, considering that all of that was established in TNG yes. and in DS9. Shh, it's yeah. okay. 
In fact, uh, none of that is actually mentioned in. Yeah, Maki aren't really Voyager. mentioned like other than like the first episode, and then like a couple yeah, times like a, to say there's, there's like, like a, they're Maki crew. There's like a Star Wars esque crawl at the beginning of Voyager, and that's it. Yeah. All right. Uh, what is the Klingon word for victory or success? Oh come on, Rob. I I have no idea. It's kapla, right? Kapla, yeah. Kapla. Kapla. All right. What cylindrical items could help boost the transporter materializations when needed? Transporter relays? They're transporter pattern enhancers. God damn, Chris. Nicely done. Shit. (laughs) They use them in a few episodes of Next Gen, if I recall. They use them a lot in uh, DS9. Yeah. I think I just need to retire. (laughs) Like, <laughs> all right, here's the last question. There's no two, but this one is worth five points, Rob. So here we go. Oh. <laughs> would that tie him up? No, 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 he would win with five. <laughs> On what he's not gonna get this. On what Romulan vessel? I don't know that Chris will either. On what Romulan vessel did Troy have to masquerade as a Romulan intelligence agency? <sighs> Fucking shit, man. Uh, do you need like a model or a name? I need a name. Uh, I got nothing then. Yeah, you can't say Warbird. <laughs> <laughs> Bird of Prey. It's like all the fucking Romulan ship names are like Desera and Desvarnen or something God, like that. Damn, you're weirdly close. I told you they're all <laughs> like that. It's the IRW Kazrara. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right, yeah. with a whopping seven to three, Chris wins that one. Whoa. <laughs> Oh no! We will have an equal chance with TNG. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh man, who played Sela? I don't even know who that fuck that is. I vaguely remember that name, but I cannot place it. Denise Crosby. Yeah, I don't know any of these fucking. These are some obscure ass shit, man. All right. Well, that'll do it for this week. Um, sorry for uh, the kind of switcheroo there on the deep dive, um, but Chris was better than mine, anyways. <laughs> Uh, we, uh, would love it if you would take a few minutes to give us a good rating, give us a review, we'll read them out on the pod, send me some mail, send me a Twittery X bullshit thing, what's that, what's that called now? A, a zit? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, send me a zit. Um, yeah. otherwise, uh, we will be here next week with hopefully a better episode, and, uh, we will see you all then. Good night, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to Captain's Log Supplemental. You can follow us on Twitter at PodCLS or send us hate mail at PodCLS3 at gmail.com.